it would be a great pleasure to be here or there rather if the, if the occasion were not so sad i was very sorry to hear of christoph's death um i knew him for quite a long time and although we never collaborated um we worked in in similar areas in conformal field theory and in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and quantum quenches and so on um one of christoph's passions was the interplay between mathematics and physics through mathematical physics and uh, so my talk is going to be about how uh, about an example of how we can take some ideas which were developed in in theoretical physics and apply them to some possibly new ideas in mathematics um so that so that so the subject of the talk is is tt bar deformed modular forms it was published earlier in the year in communications in number theory and physics so i'll explain on the next slide what tt bar actually is but um just for the time being let's just say that it denotes a certain one parameter set of deformations of a local two-dimensional quantum field theory and because it at least formally it's a scalar so if you add it into the action it preserves local rotational symmetry so it should also preserve properties like the modular invariance of partition functions but it turns out that actually proving this from its definition is non-trivial but then once one has done this one understands that similar arguments extend beyond and formal field theory to deformations of more general modular forms that arise in mathematics and other branches of mathematical physics so uh, so that's what i'm going to be talking about here um, so the outline of this talk is what is tt bar and why is it interesting I'm then going to give you one particular physical interpretation of CT bar as the coupling of a quantum field theory to an elastic medium, which gives us a very uh, practical way of thinking about it. I'll then discuss the partition function of a conformal field theory in a rectangle, which is an example of a holomorphic modular form and discuss the CT bar deformation of that and the fact that we get a simple PDE out of this but then all of this is kind of heuristic up to this point but that will then lead to a rigorous mathematical definition of the cc bar deformation of the partition function or a modular form in general and then we will prove that the that the modular property is maintained by the cc bar deformation one remarkable fact that that will emerge from this is that if we take the Mellin transform of the partition function with respect to the modular parameter which is not a thing that we normally do in physics then in fact tt bar acts multiplicatively on this in a simple way <laughs> 
And then I'll talk about real modular forms, an example being the one-point function of a local operator on the torus, and we'll go through, and we'll, we'll quickly go through the same steps as above in giving a, a regular definition of the CC bar's affirmation and the proof of the modular property. And then it turns out that these things called mass forms, which are, are examples of real modular invariants or modular forms, turn out to be eigenforms of the CC bar's affirmation. So there is something very deep going on here that that I, for one, do not understand yet, but I think it's interesting. Okay, so what is CC bar? It was originally introduced in a 2004 paper by Armologico and reintroduced in 2017. And at that point, a, a lot of people started, started a work on it. Uh, it's basically, from a formal point of view, you can think of it as a deformation of the action of a, a quantum field theory, where at each stage, in increasing the parameter lambda by an infinitesimal amount, we add an infinitesimal quantity to the action proportional to the determinant of the stress energy sensor. So in two dimensions, the stress energy sensor is, of course, a two by two matrix. So the determinant is going to be a quadratic form in the elements of T. And the important thing to realize here is that this is not a simple perturbation because at each inf infinitesimal step, we, we use the updated version of the stress sensor, which of course is derived from the action. Um, the interesting thing about this <laughs> affirmation is because this is a dimension four operator, in principle, this is a non-renormalizable interaction. It's relevant in the UV, it's irrelevant in the infrared. So one would expect all kinds of ultraviolet divergences, but it turns out because of the particular properties of this affirmation that many quantities are ultraviolet finite and they're actually calculable given the data of the undeformed area. And that makes it interesting because it's an example of a non-local. It's non-local because if you express the deformed action at finite lambda in terms of the original variables, it's a non-polynomial. So it's a non-local ultraviolet completion and it has a fundamental length scale. Now, if you deform a massive quantum field theory, it's not all that interesting because it turns out that the masses of the particles do not change. And all that happens is that there's a simple CDD factor in terms of in front of the S matrix, which, uh, which we showed, I showed with Benjamin Twyon. Uh, is equivalent to giving the particles a width proportional to the mass in the rest frame of the, 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 of the particle. And in one plus one dimensions, that is a consistent, that one can consistently do that. But I'm going to be interested in the CC bars affirmation of a conformal field theory. So one intuitive way to 
think about this is as a coupling to e elasticity. So if we, so we think about this imaginary material called CC barite, and it has elastic properties, and the matter degrees of freedom of the conformal field theory are going to couple to the elastic degrees of freedom. And the, well, and the way, of course, they, they, they're going to do that is through a coupling of the strain sensor of the elastic medium to the total stress sensor, where the, where the hat is made up of the matter stress sensor and the elastic stress sensor. And the latter, of course, as, as usual, is given by a constitutive relation of some peg matrix lambda dotted into the, into the strain sensor. And therefore, the partition function, if you write it out, uh, is going to be an integral over the elastic degrees of freedom and the massive degrees of freedom of an exponential of then something which is going to be quadratic in the strain field, which can then be integrated out because it's a Gaussian integral. Um, and, and the point is, if we're going to get something out of this, which is the determinant of the matter stress tensor, which we can write in the as form here. It turns out that we need to make this constitutive relation of this form here. Of course, doing the Gaussian integration is, is equivalent to just evaluating this exponential here at the saddle point, which is given by the, 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 the S expression here. It's worth writing that expression out in terms of its coordinates, and this is how it looks in Cartesian coordinates. And the interesting thing is that you see that the elastic response in the one direction is proportional to the stress in the two direction and vice versa. So this is a very strange material. It turns out to have infinite Poisson's ratio, which of course mean, means from a, Eu, uh, a Euclidean field theory point of view, it's, it, it's actually unstable. But we're going to kind of ignore that. If you look in Minkowski space, then these signs change and everything then makes, makes for much more sense in Minkowski space. But we're going to just interpret the Hayes equations and, and, and eventually we will get something out of this, which is, is in fact mathematically well-defined. So if you write this in terms of the displacement fields, then you get something like this, which you can then integrate with respect to x, and it looks like this. So the, so the rate of change of the displacement with the parameter lambda is very simply given by the flux of the stress across a line element between some fixed point x and small x. And the magic of the TT bar affirmation, as opposed to something else which is quadratic in T, is that because T is conserved, then this line integral is independent of the contour, and it's just given by the flux of a conserved quantity across the line interval. Once again, if you write this in terms of Cartesian coordinates, it looks rather simple. It says that the rate of change of the displacement in the one direction is... Here, I'm assuming that this interval here is in the 
if we think of one as space and two as imaginary time, so the rate of change of the spatial coordinate is the normal force across this spatial interval, and the rate of change of the time coordinate is the shear force across it. So now if we, if we start thinking about the partition function of a conformal field theory in a rectangle, it's an example of a holomorphic modular form. Um, so here I've got the, um, here I've written it down explicitly. This is an old result that dates back to the early days of string theory. Um, and here Q you can think of as the modular parameter, which is the exponential of the ratio of, of the aspect ratio of the rectangle. And eta is of course the good old dedicant eta function. So this is true for any conformal field theory, as long as we have the same conformal boundary conditions around all the sides. And I just want to use this because it's an example of a modular form. Um, I'm using modular form here in a rather loose sense, I must say. Uh, in normal terms, uh, the, 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 the exponent here raised to the power c over 2 would have to be an integer, but I'm relaxing that. So, uh, so of course, it should be that the partition function is invariant under the asymmetry of, mo of the modular group, but not, not of course, the, the C1, because that will correspond to some kind of shear of the thing, which we aren't considering here. So it's invariant under the interchange of R1 and R2, and the reason that that's true is because the Zedekind eta function is essentially a modular form of weight one half. And the Q expansion that we're doing here, you can think of as just the spectral Z comp composition of the, of the rectangle partition function if we think of, of the one direction going across as being space, the vertical direction as being imaginary time. So N2 is like the energy and N1 is like the pressure in that, from that point of view. So a, a general form for the spectral decomposition would look something like this here. But more generally, all the, all the things that I'm about to do, we can apply to a, a, a more general object, which is related instead of the Zedekind eta function here, raised to the power minus c over two, we can think of any, quote, modular form of weight k, which means that when delta goes to 1 over delta, then it gets multiplied by delta the k. I should say here that I'm using delta instead of the more conventional tau. So high delta is i times tau. So these things are defined in the right half delta plane that corresponds to the upper half tau plane. So that q so that the modulus of Q is smaller than one. Um, okay, how are we going? So the way that we can do the CC bar affirmation of this is, that, is to use the, 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 the is, is to look at a, 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 a slice of constant time if we think of a time as running upwards, and to say that what's going to happen according to the prescription that I gave you before is that the distance across the rectangle, which is R1, is going to change with lambda 
proportional to the to the normal force across this, which is N2. So, so the nice thing about the, 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 this equation is that if we work in an ensemble where the energy or N2 is fixed, like the micro, so, the, so that will be like the micro canonical ensemble if we think of this direction as imaginary time, then N2 is fixed, so it's very easy to integrate this, and that's all we get. So it's very, very simple. In the right ensemble, everything just evolves linearly with lambda. Interestingly enough, and I'm sure that Christoph would have appreciated this. You can think of this, these as the equations of a fluid in the Lagrangian description, with R being the position, lambda being the time, and M being the velocity. So it's a non interacting fluid. Very, very simple. Um, so so if we write the spectral decomposition, then what we'd like to do to define the CT bar deformation of this is, is just for each value of N2 here, change R1 goes to R1 plus lambda. The, the, the reason for the change of the sign here is that rho zero is a density in this in this variable here. So you, you just have to think about that a, a moment. So the interesting thing about this thing is it's very, very formal. Because here, N2 can be negative, for example. It's possible that there are, although the spectrum should be bounded from hello, N2 can certainly be a negative. So, uh, th th so the question is, what does it mean for the system to have a negative width? So we need to give some mathematical meaning to the, the, the Hess expression here. But before I do that, I just want to note that if you formally differentiate this with respect to lambda, you can easily see that the z lambda obeys this very simple linear differential equation here, which is almost like a diffusion equation, except we don't have an elliptic operator here. So how to make sense of this? And if we can, is, is the deformed partition function, which we, which I mean, the, the point about this formalism here is that it doesn't seem to be particularly symmetric between one and two. So can we prove this? Okay, so, so the way to make sense of this is, and I'll go through this very quickly here, is to take the Laplace transform with, with respect to R2, and the inverse one is, is, is written here. So. If we, uh, of course, this S contour is going to go parallel to the imaginary axis, but if we then, if this is suitably analytic, we can pull the contour back and, and we get the formula I wrote on, on the previous slide with this spectral density just basically being the the his continuity of this function across the branch cut. And then, of course, if this has suitable analyticity, we can easily define the, 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 the deformed one as, uh, as just shifting R1 by an amount proportional to S, because when we take the console back, S becomes essentially minus n2. And the nice thing about this is that in, in a conformal field theory, 
this function here has a scaling form which is written here and the analyticity properties of this are good enough that we can give a, a rigorous definition. So after, after some algebra, here is what we find for the deformed modular form. So alpha now is, is a dimensionless version of lambda. So lambda has dimensions of length squared. So, so here we have a dimensionless version of lambda which itself is invariant and the interchange of R1 and R2. And it appears in this formula here and here. And if you take alpha equals zero, you can easily see that we have basically a Laplace transform and an inverse Laplace transform. So, so this is how the deformation enters and, and what you can easily show is that as long as F, F, F0 is bounded, then this is a convergence integral, it's analytic and it has all kinds of nice properties. So we can basically use this as a mathematical definition of the deformed modular form. And then what we've got to prove is that this modular form has the same properties under a modular transformation, which is delta goes to one over delta. Because remember, delta was essentially the ratio, the aspect ratio, R2 over R1. So interchanging R1 and R2 is the same as delta goes to one over delta. And after some algebra, you see this exponential is quadratic in S, so we can try to, to complete the square. We can't actually do the integral, but it doesn't matter, because what one can show is that this thing is, is essentially a transform of the undeformed uh, modular form with a certain kernel here and the alpha defense is just in the kernel and the kernel is explicitly here and you see apart from all this stuff here it's essentially a gaussian smearing of the original function but the amount of smearing depends on where we are in in the modular space but the, the point is here that it's easy to see that this kernel here, as written, is invariant under, under, under the modular transformation of delta goes, goes to one over delta. So that proves that if this is invariant at alpha equals zero, so is the, the, the deformed one. And that's what we need to prove that, that that f of alpha has the same modular properties as, as f of zero does. But then what we can also do is to take that same expression which I've written, written again here and substitute into this the Q expansion, so here's the Q expansion written out explicitly of the undeformed form. And you see that delta prime occurs here and it occurs here. So we can do, term by term, we can do the delta prime integral. And then for each value, each term in the sum, we get an expression that looks like this with this quadratic expression in S in the denominator, which gives rise to poles here and here with a plus or minus sign. But then what one can do is to check that only the poles at S minus 
uh, after the life of the consul. And uh, so we can then, in each term, move the consul to the left and get the pole, uh, uh, the residue of the pole, I less minus, and then, then we, for each value of n, we get this rather ugly or, or beautiful, depending on your point of view, expression here, which shows you, once again, if you take alpha to zero, we get back to the original expression. But now we find that the exponents, instead of going up like n for large n, they go up now like the square root of n. And we have this prefactor here, which is also important. But what, what this is basically saying is that, 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 that this, this, this rather complicated series here has the same modular properties under delta goes to one over delta as to the undeformed expression here. And that would be rather surprising if somebody came to you with a series that looked like this and asked, asked you to prove that it was invariant or covariant under delta goes to one over delta. He, then, he, then you might have a hard time. An example, and uh, I think a result that almost every, everybody knows here, if you take the Jacobi theta functions at zero, uh, 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 zero argument as a function of the modulus, then for example, theta three is a sum over n of these e to the minus pi n squared times delta, under this obeys this very simple functional equation here. As is, it behaves like a modular form of weight one half. And everybody knows how to prove this using the Poisson Ham formula. And uh, I believe it was originally discovered by Gauss. But the statement the here is that the same functional equation is true for the deformed object, which looks like this. And if you try to use the Poisson sum formula to prove this, you will run up against an integral that you can't do. It's, it, it is nevertheless true that this thing has the same modular properties under delta goes to, to one over delta. And, and within a restricted region of delta, it's also holomorphic. In fact, it's holomorphic in the right half plane, but it doesn't enjoy the same periodicity and the tau goes to tau plus one because, of course, all these exponentials here are now, are now irrational functions of delta. So now I'm briefly going to mention the Mellin transform. So whenever we have a modular form, we can associate to this modular form a Herschelist series. For example, if we take the modular form I've been using here, if we take the Mellin transform of this with, with, with respect to delta, then of course, term by term, we can do this. And uh, apart from this rather trivial factor here, we get a Dirichlet series or a generalized Dirichlet series. And, and because of the modular properties of F, you can prove that 
as a function of this, this is analytic in the rights of a certain strip, and it enjoys this reflection property. So the consequence of the modular property here is this reflection property. So the standard example is if you take that Jacobi theta function that I wrote on the previous transparency and do this, you essentially get the Riemann's theta function. So uh, now, if we do this for the, the, for the, 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 the deformed function using the formula which I wrote here, then after doing some various changes of variables, what you find is quite re remarkably that the, the, the Mellon transform of the deformed modular form is a, a universal function which is independent of which modular form we're talking about times the Mellon transform of the undeformed one. And this universal function is this expression here, oops, which is essentially <coughs> after some massaging is um, a confluent hypergeometric function. And the important thing is that you can see that this function is an entire function of S. And it satisfies the same reflection property. So the deformation uh, inherits the reflection property and the zeros of S. So if we look at the, 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 the deformed, so if we start with the, the Riemann theta function here, and we, which corresponds to the Jacobi theta function, and we look at the deformed version of that, this will inherit the same zeros as the Riemann's eta function. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to lead to a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, but... Huh. Anyway, so... And it's left. I'm going to talk about this, the the interesting case of the torus, which is, which in a conformal field theory is an example of a, of a real modular form. If we talk about the partition function, it's a, a modular invariant, but it, it's useful to be a little more general and to think about the one-point function of a scale, of a local operator, in particular a scalar operator, which we'll call phi. So it's useful to label the torus not in the usual way by a parameter tau, because once we make the deformation, then we've broken the scale invariant. So it's going to depend on the size of the torus as well. So, so, so we just think of the torus as being uh, a tessellation of the plane by a lattice here, whose elementary vectors are R1 and R2. So once again, we can write a spectral decomposition, uh, and we can think of the Q expansion as being the same as that spectral a composition, except we now have Q and Q bar or Q star, and and um, and we're going to assume what will be true for the one-point function is that it would transform like a real modular form with a certain k here, which would be related to the scaling dimension of this particular operator. And it's invariant under tau goes to tau plus one, which is the same as delta goes to delta minus i. Uh, 
so the evolution once again is simple at fixed force and once again it's linear in lambda and this gives us a, once again this thing is going to satisfy a PDE which now looks like this but we want to once again give a, a rigorous definition and it turns out the appropriate thing looks similar to what we had before but a bit more complicated but once again what we can show is that this can be written in terms of a kernel k alpha and that kernel once again enjoys nice properties under the s of sl2z and the delta goes to one over delta or tau goes to minus one over tau and it's interesting that that it's it's a similar smeared gaussian time stuff and this kernel here is called the selberg kernel and plays an important role in harmonic analysis on sl2z and this then ensures that the deformed modular form transforms in the same way so we have a rigorous definition uh, and, and it has all the nice properties if we look at the q expansion of this once again it looks complicated and messy but if you take alpha goes to zero here you get back to the original expression for the modular form and this expression here in the exponent will be recognized by anybody who's read the papers on cc bar as the zomological deformed spectrum which which now depends upon the energy or the scaling dimension and the momentum of the state p here um and just to finish with uh if we're now talking about real modular forms rather than holomorphic modular forms then one needs to impose extra conditions on them for to be for them to be interesting and the thing that is often done is to impose that they be harmonic rather than holomorphic so that means that the eigenfunctions of the invariant Laplacian in the half plane, which is this expression here. So, so, so if they are these eigenfunctions and they're invariant or actually covariant, that is, they transform like modular forms and they're polynomially bounded and so on and so forth then they're called mass forms and these seem to be important in mathematics and they're very interesting in all kinds of ways so if you recall the pde which i wrote down if we have a scaling solution of this which is what we have that is in principle it doesn't depend upon these three variables but it only depends on delta which is a modular parameter and this dimensionless form of lambda then it's a matter of a few lines of algebra just to show that this pde reduces to a very simple diffusion equation on the half plane and it shows in particular that if f happens to, happens to be a, a mass form that means it's an eigenfunction of the Laplacian then it means that the deformed mass form is just a multiple of the old uh, undeformed mass form so the mass forms are eigenfunctions of the cc bar deformation so we have an interesting connection here with this thing that came out of physics with something which is of interest to mathematicians and this needs to be explored a lot more so uh, 
I've assumed here that lambda is positive and delta is positive, but there are ways around this. There are interesting things happen. If delta is negative, then then we get these Hagedorn type transitions, which going back to the fluid analogy corresponds to the formation of shocks, it turns out. So, so there's an interesting connection here between what's going on here and fluid dynamics also. But I don't have time to go into that, unfortunately. So I'll just uh, say a, a, a few words of summary that the, the nice properties of the CT bar deformation of a conformal field theories extend by the same arguments to a more general mathematical objects. They give us a way of deforming all these classic functions of the 19th century, like, like the Jacobi theta functions and so on. You can also argue that in some sense that remains to be made ex explicit that this deformation is unique, that it's the only one that gives us, uh, that preserves the modularity and also gives us a, a, a discrete spectrum, for example. So that's interesting, I think. But as for what is the significance for physics of these mass forms, I don't know. And why would one want to take the Mellin transform of a partition function with respect to its, its modulus? That's not something that we normally do, but apparently it has some simple behavior under the CC bar's affirmation. So with that, I will end and I hope that you enjoy your wine and cheese and I will and I wish I were there with you to help you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, I can't very, hear thank you very much, John. Are there questions? Hi, uh, thank you, John, for this nice talk. This is Benjamin. So, um, about the uniqueness, uh, of course, one can deform with other type of uh, deformation like that. I mean, a QJ deformation for other densities and currents. So, we could think of taking the higher conserved densities and currents of CFT, T squared, T cube, and all that. So, would we not get some nice properties like that as well? Well, um, yes, of course, I didn't have time to mention this, but as, as, as you know, um, you can take any pair of currents and, and form their cross products and, um, and you get something which has simple properties under this affirmation. The nice thing about CT bar is that it has this nice geometrical interpretation. Whilst the, uh, I think it's harder to understand the geometrical interpretation of the higher spin currents. Um, but I think one could probably devise mathematical objects which have this, uh, a similar property. And so these kind of things might then extend in the same way and one will be able to prove some kind of modularity. I can't hear anything else. All right. I, I, I have a question. What is the origin of the name TT bar? What is the bar? Oh, yes, I failed to explain that. I'm really sorry. Um, if you start from a conformal field theory, or, or, or rather, Okay, in a conformal field theory, there are 
In the two-dimensional quantum field theory in general, there are three independent components of the stress energy sensor. One is called C, the other is C bar, and the other is the trace of the stress sensor. And those are called the complex components. If you write down the determinants of the stress sensor in those components, then it's equal to CC bar minus the square of the trace. So in a conformal field theory, the trace is zero. So the determinant is proportional to CC bar. And that's why it's become called, why it's now called CC bar. I did lead a campaign a few years ago that it shouldn't be called CC bar, it should be called the determinant of C, but that doesn't roll off the tongue in the same way. So it's still called CC bar, okay? I have a question regarding what you just said. You said that the trace is equal to zero. What about in a, in a curved space-time where the trace is not equal to zero? Would there be uh, any effect on this? Uh, well, bar? yes, but this is a very good question. Well, essentially, although you can try to define the CC bar deformation in a curved space, it doesn't have the same nice properties. All uh, that I was saying was true in a flat metric. Now, people have applied this in curved space to a conformal field theory at large central charge, which is a, the, if, you're talk, if you're interested in the, in the ADS-CFT correspondence, then you're interested in large C. Uh, and at large C, CT bar, factorizes into C times C bar. And there, of course, then you can make sense of, of it even in curved space, and that's what people do. But, it, but if you're thinking about deforming a conformal field theory at finite C, then I believe the answer is that we don't know how to write that in curved space in a way that it has all the nice properties. I hope that answers your question. Any more uh, questions? I do have a question, John. This is Jean Bernard. Uh, could you please recall the the properties of this, um, the definition of this uh, hypothetical uh, TT bar that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, how far do you want me <laughs> to go back? Ah, yes, that was the response to the. So, could it be that to answer to, to so 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 it's basically perturbing the action by the determinant of c yes here yeah. so could it be to, to answer your, your, the, the the last question of your slides could it be that these mass forms would be describing the the properties of this city barite um well, maybe, I mean, basically, um, basically, uh, if you think about so, 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 so these mass forms are, are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, so in the space of L2, L2 functions on the half plane, they form a basis, okay? So, so in principle, if you took the modular invariant partition function on the torus, um, then you could expand it in a basis of, of mass forms. And there is a paper on the on the archive by 
Benjamin et al, where they attempt to do that. And that would mean, and, uh, but the, the, unfortunately, the, 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 the partition function of a conformal field theory with positive central charge diverges as Q goes to zero or Q goes to one. Um, so this this expansion would only work for for conformal field theories with a negative central charge. Um, but y you could think of them as being some kind of CT bar, right? Then if you c c c c c c c c couple them in this way. But what the Hess expression here says is that if I want to take large alpha, then only the only the mass form with the smallest eigenvalue is going to be important. So, so I think it's an interesting idea that one can try to use this as a basis for for writing modular invariant partition functions, but we have to deal with this question uh, that they have to be L2 functions. One thing that one can do and is to take the inverse of the partition function. So if we have a partition function of a conformal field theory with a positive central charge, and we take the inverse of the partition function, then that is, a, is L2 finite in this space of functions, and it can then be expanded. But I don't know quite what it means to look at the inverse of the partition function. It has all kinds of strange things going on here, which I don't understand yet. Any more questions? Thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank John again. Thank you very much, John, for being with us tonight. Yes, and I hope you enjoy your cheese and wine. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Right, bye-bye. Thank you.